I'm Nelson Bird and welcome to a very special presentation of Indigenous Circle. The tulips you see behind me are a symbol of the relationship between the Netherlands and Canada. 55 years ago, Canadian soldiers were instrumental in the liberation of this country. Among those fighting were First Nations people of Canada. Several Saskatchewan First Nations veterans recently made their way back here to reflect upon their experiences both during and after the war. Their story is an important one and we'll have it for you right after the break. People will have to get together regardless who they are, what color they are, they will have to work together in order to live in peace all over the world. If we don't, there will be wars all over. Philip Fable's words reflect what most war vets feel in their heart. The 79-year-old veteran is from the Sweetgrass Reserve in northwest Saskatchewan. 58 years ago, he was among thousands of Canadians who signed up to fight in World War II. The war engulfed almost every country in the 20th century's largest and most horrific conflict. Canadian soldiers fought on many fronts. They were instrumental in winning the war against the Nazi forces and their allies. Whether in Europe, Africa, or the Pacific Rim, Canadians were there. First Nation soldiers were among the Canadian contingent, more than 800 alone from Saskatchewan. I seen a sign that join the army and see the world. <laughs> so just like nothing, I, uh, I didn't even stop thinking of anything. I was young that time. Here's my chance to see the world, I thought. So I signed up. <laughs> well, I don't know, there's a lot of guys, you know, who are joining up, some from down home, some other areas, and then I thought I might as well join up too, although I was married already. But I joined up, you know, to... Uh, to do what I was supposed to do, I guess, you know. I don't know what really made me join up, you know. I really don't know, you know. But you, you knew that there was a war going I on? I know there was a war on, and then I know that um, either I'll come back or stay. Once overseas, First Nation soldiers were like any other soldier, kill or be killed. You shoot first and ask questions later. Then we came to know that um, if we're going to ask somebody some, something or someone is going to try to kill us, well, we shoot him too, huh? The faster you shoot, the better. And then you don't need no, no questions. I've seen a, a lot of, lot of dead, dead uh, uh, people, of course, but dead animals too, you know, and sm smashed, smashed up houses and whatnot. And uh, it's, uh, that's, that's about what, what I've seen, you know, the... the uh, the battlefields. Those fields are silent now, but Howard Anderson remembers those days well. The Germans broke through in the, on the American side, and what they done, they put wire around on the road, and we had one of my friends get his head cut off from it. Because in the, with the jeeps that you see that we were riding in, they had an iron bar up in front of them so they could cut the wire and we had to stay behind this jeep. Holland experienced firsthand the atrocities of war. Throughout 1944 and 45, Nazi forces occupied the country. It was a time of death and inexplicable horror. Canadian soldiers freed the people of the Nazi menace. <laughs> 55 years later, thousands of Canadian veterans returned to Holland for a special and probably final reunion. Nine First Nations veterans from Saskatchewan were among them. Whoever thought we'd come back to Holland and be part of this? You know, I says, why did you want to come? I says, because I says, I'd like to have seen it. And I says, I think you guys would like to have seen it too. I says, I says it's all part of us. I says, Holland is liberated. And I says, that's what they're celebrating. And we were part of this the liberation people, I said, so, I said, and, and they're very excited and very happy to come. I feel real good about it, you know, I mean, to be recognized and to be on, on a parade, show the people who I am and, and what I done, eh, that's, 
and that's the thing I feel good about. Eh? They're not the same kind of people as I seen 55 years ago. They weren't laughing. They weren't enjoying themselves, you know? They're more or less like well, a lot of them, you know, maybe they didn't have any homes, yeah? In some areas, because I've seen a lot of, even in France, all the way down, I've seen a lot of old people, kids, on the street. They were putting their hand like that, huh? They were hungry, I guess, so they didn't have nothing to eat. So the old people and the kids, you know? Not so much as uh, younger people, huh? Because they were all uh, maybe fighting, eh? Holland has changed dramatically in 50 years. A happy, secure people walk city streets, thoughts of conflict far removed from their minds. The small northern European country has experienced a population boom. The country now has a population of over 16 million people with almost as many bicycles. Small towns are now cities. During the war, we, well, I don't, we didn't know where the people were, but it seems, where did they come from when the war ended? Eh? The, the whole, just like this. You'd think that maybe they were hiding up in the hills, out in the forest. Eh? You, during the war, you don't hardly see a civilian. Eh? Well, they got to hide too, eh? from the shelling and stuff. Eh? The people of Holland no longer hide in the shadows for safety. They are very quick to show their appreciation of war veterans, especially Canadians. First Nations veterans, the recipient of much of their gratitude. Near the Tulip Fields on the coast of Holland is the town of Katvik. It was here that the veterans were a guest of honor at a special luncheon, appropriate because 55 years ago, Canadian veterans gave food to the Dutch people who at the time were near starvation. When we were in the Rotterdam there, when we used to eat outside, eh? And the kids would come there to, you know, you, you hate to see somebody hungry, eh? You just give them a supper, your dinner, whatever, eh? You know, try to help them out, eh? These uh, old DC-3s, they come down low and they drop food, eh? Yeah, S sometimes we'd, we'd help them. About 100 Canadian veterans, including the delegation of First Nation veterans, were honored at a lunch to recall their heroic efforts. 23-year-old Frederick Nordhaus is a police officer in training and spoke from the heart about conflicting attitudes among his generation. As I was working uh, this morning real early, I'm a police officer in The Hague. I was uh, walking around in the city and I saw two, two gentlemen walking around. And uh, we're trained to, to look at them, the way they dress, the way they walk. And I noticed they were wearing army boots, um, blue jeans, a bomber jacket, and they had almost no hair. And what does it say to me? Um, they're part of a, a group um, that stands for uh, old values, uh, values we and certainly you will remember from the Second World War, people we describe as Nazis. And I was so much ashamed to see this younger generation of which I'm part of, um, to still believe in those values. And so, sir, I would um, like to apologize for those people of my generation that still believe these things. And sirs, it's my greatest honor to have you here. Stay tuned, our Indigenous Circle special returns right after the break. The Grosbeek Cemetery is located a few kilometers from the German border in southeast Holland. 3,000 Canadian soldiers are buried there. The overcast conditions seemed only fitting as Canadian veterans honored the memory of their fallen comrades in a pipe ceremony. It's very touching and it was quite touching for all of us. It's honoring people and the sweet grass is to smudge everyone and cleanse everyone. You get cleansed before you have the pipe ceremony. Grosbeek Cemetery looks like many other wartime burial sites, row upon row of white headstones. But for the veterans, the emotion was undeniable, a moment which will be forever etched in their minds. I felt terrible there because a lot of them guys are the same age as I was, like, you know? There was there when I was 18, 19, and this is exactly the same age these people were, you know? They were a few, couple of months away from 
ending the war and they passed, they got killed. But the rows of gravestones would give way to a more uplifting moment. That came in a meeting with Tony Hennekamp. Now in her 60s, Tony recalls her days as an adolescent trying to survive a war. We lived in the cellar. After the, the bombardment in uh, October, and then we moved for six weeks to uh, a farm because our home was now uh, not completely destroyed, but not to live in. The pipe ceremony attracted curious but thankful onlookers, locals anxious to pay their respect to the First Nations visitors. Tony, who regularly visits the graveyard of fallen Canadians, like was honored with a braid of sweetgrass. Sweet if you smell it. For her and many Dutch people, North American Indians hold a special nice. place in their money, hearts. Money, money. I, I'm always thinking of Indians, they were the citizens, the, the real citizens of America and now in Canada. The face, the looking, as, as you look, there is for me something, yeah, power. It's May 4th, Holland's official day to remember those who died during the Nazi occupation. The ceremony took place here at Dam Square in Amsterdam. Canadian veterans were also invited to participate and our First Nations veterans also paid their respects. Every year, thousands of people turn out for a moment of silence and a brief ceremony. At 8 p.m., the country stops to observe a moment of silence. As in years past, Holland's royal family, led by Queen Beatrice, takes part in the ceremony with the laying of the wreaths. First Nations veterans lay a single flower and offer up a heartfelt salute. Every step of this journey brings back a flood of memories. Raymond Laplante is originally from the Coaquitous First Nation in central Saskatchewan. He was stationed in the small town of Austin in northern Holland. That's where we were, in that park over there. There was a park there? Yeah. yeah. Uh, now, uh, uh, we had about 35 trucks in that area. All, all, the way from the way, all the way down there, probably up to there somewhere. Like most soldiers, Raymond and his troop often helped local civilians any way they could. He recalls one particular girl. Tini Klein was her name. He recalls fondly how his troop would give food to the young girl and her family. They'd come in with us and we'd give her something to eat, you know, and she was happy, come home happy. And, but then we moved over to our winter quarters. And that's when we found out that uh, she uh, had lost her dad. And we asked her why. Well, she said uh, the Germans came for her. She says one day the German truck came in there, and out came a bunch of soldiers and surrounded the house. And they got our da uh, my dad. And uh, they took him in a truck, threw him in a truck, and that was it. But then the other soldiers started looking around all over for the radio set. And apparently, he'd been. Uh, sending messages across the pond for intelligence. And uh, he told us that, well, we were interested, you know, we wanted to know just what really happened. So that's how we started coming up to her house. Yeah, so, they, so they found the radio then with the guy? Oh yeah, yeah, they found the radio. They took the radio and the aerial, they pulled it down. Everything, I guess, they turned the place upside down. And she was crying one day. She was. Raymond kept in contact with the young girl long after the war. He was hoping to see her on this trip. It wasn't to be. She wrote to me afterwards, different. She kept writing to me for a couple of years after that. And uh, she said uh, she never did say anything about her dad coming back. I don't think there was ever any chance Probably of him not. ever coming back. You know, I think once they got him, that was it. He was a goner because they shot, they shot most of those uh, people, you know. Raymond's disappointment at not finding the young girl was overshadowed by a reception he received on the streets of Austin. Yeah, go to George. Oh, oh yeah, that's right. From yeah. the Eng uh, King of England. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. the welcome in Austin wasn't the only one that was warm. Often the reception was befitting of royalty. In Katvik, the vets attended a military tattoo, and because they were the only Canadian veterans there, their entrance was memorable. Earlier, thousands had turned out to greet all the Canadian vets at a special Remembrance Day parade. 
Coming up after the break, we'll tell you the story of one man's struggle to stay alive after escaping from a POW camp. Henry Beaudry, now a successful artist, was a teenager from the Sweetgrass First Nation when he went to war. His story is one of bravery and suspense. In 1943, he spent time on the front lines in Italy and on occasion behind enemy lines. We went behind the lines and, and took some German food and the, the snipers were, we couldn't, you couldn't go across a big open field, you know, and, and uh, it was flat too. So um, our guys couldn't come across, so they sent us, I don't know, I, I forget, maybe 20 of us to go and cut that communication, you know. And, uh, so we cut, off, we cut them off and we, we let them starve for a while too. Tempting fate became a way of life for Beaudry. December 13, 1943 is a day in his life he will not forget. It was a day that took him from front lines to a German prisoner of war camp. We were in a big building, you know, and uh, they surrounded us and the, the, bur the building was burning and uh, we were telling the Germans, uh, the Germans were shouting outside, uh, told us came out Englishmen and uh, the boys were swearing at them, you know, and I don't want to say this, <laughs> but uh, you know, things like that happened. So finally we went out of the ministry towards morning. The guys were all, all killed, you know. And uh, <coughs> I went under a table and I didn't know what to do. I just pulled my, I just sent the, all at once the Germans came in, you know, early in the morning, December. They were poking at all the guys who was, who was alive, I guess. The time came, they poked me, and I had to move. As soon as I moved, they grabbed me put my arm, you know. So, anyway, they took us outside. I was wounded in the head that time. So, but my, I couldn't hear nothing. My ears were just plugged. I couldn't hear for two days. Only 21 of 300 Canadians survived the German assault. For those that did, like Beaudry, a battle for survival of a different sort followed. The Germans led us out to sing or do some work outside or something. And I had a friend from Siberia, he was a Mongolian. He was in the Russian army. He was my friend in the, in the prison camp. You know, uh, there was hardly anything to eat in there. We had a bowl of soup uh, once a day, or not a bowl of soup, but a cup of soup anyway. One day, Beaudry and a friend simply walked away. And we traveled for two months, from February till April. We got to American lines. We didn't know where to go, but uh, we, we traveled anyway, by foot. All that time, we never slept in a building or anything. We slept outside. Sometimes haystack, we, you know. And uh, the farmers were good enough to give us something to, to eat. Beaudry and his companion, with no idea of where they were, found safety when they came across some American troops. I was so weak, I uh, just made it, you know. My legs were just uh, swollen up, and they set up their tents. There were showers there, everything, lost to eat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so, in a way, <coughs> they told me to clean up, you know, and had a shower and everything, and you know, I never changed clothes for how many months. Yeah, <laughs> with the same deal. They took all my clothes, they gave me all the new uniform, but they're American, you know. The war ended in Holland a short time later. May 5th, 1945 holds special memories for the vets, but no two vets share exactly the same recollection. We were still on standby, and they told us to go and uh, take our stuff out. There's a kind of a forest up here, a bush, a kind of a big bush, you know. They told us to stay up there because uh, there were so many people firing guns here. You know, some people, sometimes you'd hear a machine gun go, you know, and they'd 
fire a few rounds. Yeah, just excitement, I guess. I don't know. And uh, we were up there for about three weeks. We're in the southern part, and uh, we heard uh, we were meeting the Germans. They, they were walking home. Oh, oh just, just lining up people for the horses and wagons. And we, we didn't have much time. We were pretty well we lost everything. I guess. Once we got word a day after that it had been signed, then we celebrated. And we celebrated. And we celebrated <laughs> some more. <laughs> in East Central Holland, just 35 kilometers from the German border, is the town of Wagenhagen. It was at the Hotel de Verold that German and Canadian officials sat down to sign the unconditional surrender of the 25th German Army. The months, even the years of living in bunkers, sleeping with one eye open and wondering if they would be the next to be killed, were over. The Canadian soldiers had done what was necessary to give freedom back to the people. The war was over and the veterans would soon be home. However, the Indian soldiers would have another battle to face upon their return to Canada. And that's one of the subjects we'll explore when this Indigenous Circle special continues. A veteran's return, a return to a battle of another kind, one without guns and bullets, a 50-year struggle against broken promises and misdeeds. And we'll see how many vets believe that to this day, the governments of countries they help liberate pay more respect and recognition to them for their efforts than does the Canadian government, the government that sent them to fight in the first place.